Welcome to Tattooed Freaks and Business Suits, recorded live in the kitchen of the Personal Touch Career Services in Denver, Colorado. I am your host, Donna Shannon. As a professional career coach, I help people navigate the hiring maze to get to the jobs they really love. In addition to working with job seekers one-on-one, I do have a book available. You can find How to Get a Job Without Going Crazy on Amazon. And today my guest is Harry Pritchett, who is a fellow career coach. Say hi, Harry. Hello. All right. We'll come back to Harry in just a moment. (laughs) So our show's purpose is to explore and redefine the world of work, especially as Gen X, millennials, and those to come after seek positions of leadership that still allow them to be themselves. Every show, we will explore a topic related to business or job searching. And of course, we're going to talk about tattoos. Our sponsor is the Personal Touch Career Services, Denver's top-rated career coaches. We focus on the practical tools for your job search, including resumes, LinkedIn profiles, job search coaching, and ongoing classes. Check out our ridiculously long website, personaltouchcareerservices.com. Once again, that's personaltouchcareerservices.com, or, you know, just Google it. Hi, Harry. Hi, Donna. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. So let's just kind of dive into things. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I live in New York City and I have for, gee, 35 plus years. Uh, I came to New York City and I worked in the mailroom of a rock and roll talent agency because I thought uh, when I left college, I was going to be a rock and roll talent agent. And um, at some point during those first couple of years early on, I I started taking a comedy improv class. uh, And I knew I had kind of found uh, my mothership, as it were. Mm -hmm. And um, that led me to start taking classes. And then I got into a company called Chicago City Limits, uh, performed around the country and... um, and then on the main stage of New York, then became a, an actor and a voiceover actor, which led me to humor writing and performing. And uh, uh, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, um, until fast forward to about four or five years ago when that business changed and uh, uh, I had to kind of face the change and, and deal with it and um, started my kind of my own reinvention journey, which led me to coaching. Mm-hmm. So there you go. I think we're done. Yeah. And you do a little bit different kind of coaching that, than we offer. So one thing that, yeah. you know, my service I don't really do is I don't help people figure out their passions or what they're going to be when they grow up or those mm-hmm. kind of things. But you tend to work with people who are kind of like in that next phase of their career. Yeah. And, and tell me more about that. Yeah, well, I, I primarily work with people that are approaching or are in middle age. That's not to say that I haven't worked with people that are younger, but um, there's a difference in the sense that, you know, when we approach middle age or we're in middle age, many people stop and there's that question of why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as, a spo- as opposed to when we're younger, it's about, you know, how am I going to get a job and how am I going to do this and how am I going to make money? Not that that's not important when you're older, but the question of why becomes uh, kind of more prevalent. And so I work with people that are, that, that are stopping and pausing and really asking that question because a lot of people kind of stay on the hamster wheel as it were, and just kind of Mm -hmm. trudge forward without really stopping and thinking Mm -hmm. um, about, am I, am I happy with what I'm doing? Um, Or am I just doing this because this is what I've been doing my whole life. So I work with people that are willing to kind of, you know, stop and, and, and ask themselves, okay, who am I right now in my life? And are the choices that I'm making uh, fulfilling and meaningful mm-hmm. in, in both my life and, and my career? So, you know, as, as I'm well, I'm sure you know as well that in coaching, there's that fine line between the personal stuff and the career stuff, you know, and the two kind of, you know, they, they share, they, they work with one another. You can't avoid one without mm-hmm. kind of um, touching base with the other. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things I didn't realize before, I just kind of realized in the past week or two, is that you do help 
people with coaching and to like getting into voice acting and acting as well, because you yeah. have 25 years of experience in that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of something else. It's interesting when I embarked on uh, my career as a you know career transition coach, uh, I had I had kind of left that behind. You know, the acting and the voiceovers. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with William Bridges' book Transitions, but he he talks about you know the the first thing that we have to deal with during uh, a change of some kind and our transition in relationship to the change is is the ending. So the ending always comes first and and part of that is kind of letting go to make space for how you want to move forward and for me it was kind of saying goodbye and at the time my industry was so non-existent you know because I made most of my my living doing the voiceovers I did other acting stuffs but my primary income came from voiceovers so I said that I, I kind of said goodbye to that and that's what I needed to do then to really dive into the coaching thing. I went back to school. I got certified. I got some other certifications specifically in change and transition. And then here we are, what, five years later. And, you know, I'm starting to do some voiceover work again. I'm starting to do the voiceover coaching stuff again. So, you know, I, I'm kind of an example of, of some of my clients. And that is, you know, the, there's opportunities around us all the time. Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the willingness to kind of stay open to the opportunities and whether or not we want to pursue them. Yeah. And yeah. so, so yeah, so I am doing, I'm doing the transition coaching. I'm doing some voiceover work again. I'm doing some voiceover coaching. So, you know, it's kind of a, a grab bag. Sure. <laughs> so what do you think is the most important thing for anybody to know about getting into acting work? Should they do training and acting lessons or just kind of rely on their talent? Now you mean the voice, the voiceover acting, or yeah. acting in general? Let's talk about the voiceover acting. Okay, yeah, because that's that's very specific. So um, I would say nowadays the industry has changed a lot in the sense I was part of a very, I wouldn't call it a small group, but a a, a group of un, union actors who who made a living. You could call us kind of the um, the middle class of the uh, the commercial acting. <laughs> Okay, you've got your celebrities, and then there was there was us down there below. But we, you know, we made a living, mm -hmm. and we we had for some time. And and I would say probably the turning point was years ago. There was a big strike, and we were out for six months. And the producers kind of made a discovery, and that was, oh, we can go produce commercials overseas for a lot mm -hmm. less money. We can hire non-union actors, and so the business changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so now there's a lot of non-union people doing the work and there's also a lot of celebrities and that middle class has become fewer and fewer. Mm. So companies are either willing to pay celebrity A, B or C $5 million a year or pay nothing. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a strange, it's a strange world. So for anyone getting into it, uh, it it's a, it, it's a, it's an interesting time. Let me put it that way. So sure. um, I just worked with, with a young man who um, uh, came to me because he needed some work putting um, a, a tape together. So I, I would recommend somebody take class. I think taking classes with a group of people is really helpful mm -hmm. uh, because you can hear other people, uh, the, the, the positive things that they're doing and some of the things that, that aren't working, you can start hearing those things. And if you're with a good teacher, they can point those things out to you. Um, taking an improv class, you know, if you're not an actor, mm -hmm. okay, more and more people that have just good instruments mm -hmm. are, are doing voiceovers. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to work because there is, excuse me, a degree of acting involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, I would not recommend some people that there are places out there that, that say that you can, okay, sign up with us and, you know, we're going to teach you how to do that. And then we're going to make a reel. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would never, I'm very, very upfront with my voiceover coaching clients. And I tell them, I am not going to let you move forward to make a reel until I feel like you're ready to do so because your reel is like your uh, headshot as an actor. Right. You want it to be the best presentation you can without being fake. Right. 
right? And for, for any of our new people who have like never heard of this whole voiceover career before and how it gets, so you're real, it's like clips, audio clips of your very best work put together, just kind of like a mini album, if Absolutely. you think about it. That's and, exactly right. And so you I, wouldn't want to put something out there real slip shoddy. It's very similar to like a resume. You, your dream job is out there and you just like throw together a resume. Like when, <laughs> when I was on radio, I, I saw some very interesting resumes from like people who had written stuff on like notebook paper. And they're like, when I'm high with my friends, they say I'm funny <laughs> as the morning DJs. So you should hire me. Oh, wow. Literally true. Literally true. I saw resumes like that. You don't want to, that's obviously we're not going to hire them or talk to them. And no. you don't want to come across like that when you're trying to get voiceover work. Exactly. And then the other edge of the side of that is that you want to make sure you can walk the talk. Mm -hmm. So if you make a really good reel, you want to also make sure that you're at the point where if you go into a casting office and they give you two opportunities to audition, that you can nail it mm -hmm. within those first two takes. Because you're not going to get 10, 15 takes for an audition. Yeah. So they need to get a sense almost immediately that you are within, you're in the running. And that's um, doing a cold read. So not stumbling over the words, figuring out what your inflection is going to be and taking direction if they give it at any, at that point. Those that's are the right. things, you know, taking it's not direction just. And, and understanding what they actually mean when they say, throw it away more or have more fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> May, uh, smile. Yeah. That's right. Right. <laughs> make it, yeah. Make it sound slower, but speed it up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that I see, because I work with a lot of people in the entertainment industry on the production side of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing a lot more content is being generated and produced for these streaming services. So in that sense, you mentioned there's a lot more non-union actors. Do you think the industry is growing in potential for people wanting to break in? You mean in the, now the streaming stuff, are you talking about like uh, television shows and, and things yeah, like Yeah, like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon. Right. Well, there's, it's, it's interesting because even those shows, there's so many of them um, that they're trying to, they're trying to renegotiate the union contract so they don't have to pay as much. No. Um, I'm, I'm kind of removed from that now. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of left the acting world. Mm -hmm. So to speak, um, just when, you know, in fact, I remember I left when uh, House of Cards was just coming up and I, I got an audition for that. And as you know, and, and I had made a choice, a personal choice just to kind of uh, leave that and redirect some of my focus. Um, so in terms of the voiceover world and how it relates to that, it, it doesn't really at, the, at mm -hmm. this point. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because... I, one thing to understand too, I mean, this like goes way back to my college days because they talked about, oh, all this stuff is going to change and we're going to need so much content produced it and everything's going to HD. And what they did not take into account is the fact that everybody now has an HD camera in their pocket, yep. which means these extremely high production standards that we were striving to meet that were very expensive when I was in school are now very cheap. Yep. End. And with all production costs coming down, it's sometimes more about con uh, content uh, quantity over quality. Absolutely. I, I think we're, we're in a time across the board where mediocrity rules. Oh, that's a good way to put it. And I experienced that when an engineer some time ago, a sound engineer some time ago, told me that he did an all-day session uh, with a non-union voiceover person. And I am not by any means saying all non-union people are not talented. There's many talented non-union people, but I would say the majority are not as, as skilled as the union people. There, I'll say it, and I just said it. So he told me that it, he had spent all day working with a non-union actor, recording a bunch of small little spots for a radio campaign. And he said it was brutal. It was grueling and it was all day, but mm -hmm. the client didn't care. They were saving so much money on the talent cost mm -hmm. that they didn't care. Yeah. I'm not saying that's true with all 
you know, because there's still a lot of good, high quality stuff. But I agree with you. I think it's become less and less. And I, I, you see that everywhere. You see that in resumes. Mm -hmm. You see that um, in my my sister and brother-in-law were our designers. <clears throat> they used to design websites and logos. Now you can do that all online. Mm -hmm. So you go to a networking event, somebody hands you your card, you can tell they printed that off, off the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. online. Yeah. It's like people say, oh, I can make my, make up my own resume. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, <laughs> but <laughs> you end up with the guy saying, I love to get high with my friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, in addition to having like a really good reel, what are some other top advice you would want to give somebody about getting into voiceovers? Uh, well, hooking up with a really good agent. You know, I mean, uh, the opportunities that I get are through my agent and they're one of, uh, what, well, certainly I think one of the top um, agencies in, in the world. And they're, you know, they're getting the best opportunities. Are there other opportunities available? Sure there are, but you know, one of the, one of the disadvantages of, of not being in the union is you're kind of opening yourself up for the wild west. Mm -hmm. So let's say you come across a voiceover audition opportunity online. Uh, Joe Schmo from Wisconsin will do it for 500 bucks. Phil from Philadelphia will do it for 300 and then it becomes like, okay, I'll do it for a hundred. I'll do it for 50. And before you know it, you know, there's a lot of people spending all day in their closets recording commercials and, <laughs> and, you know, not making as much as they could. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and, you know, fortunately I've, I've been doing this enough and have been very, very uh, fortunate. You know, I'm, I, I have a pension now through the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA mm -hmm. uh, after years of paying dues and working through the union um, health benefits. Um, you know, so I, look, I don't, I, I didn't want this to turn into a plug for the union, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's, it, oh, I, I guess I'm emphasizing kind of highlighting the, where the state of the business is right now. Right. And I think that's important to know because there's a lot of these websites out there like voices.com yep. or voiceovers.com where you can just throw your audition out there and then you can bid for little tiny jobs and yeah well fiverr i don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with them oh yeah they're, adver they're yeah. advertising all of oh they do resumes too don't they oh yes they do they'll do like real bad resumes for real cheap <laughs> yeah you can get a voiceover for five bucks so what are some downsides to consider about this type of work well you know the unpredictability of it of course i mean um I, I was very fortunate to have a very long stretch of, you know, uh, employment in, in a very unpredictable business. I had, I had great years. I had okay years. I had not so good years. I had bad years. But I, I was always able, in, in that, you know, 25 plus year span, I was always able to pay my rent, you know, my bills. Uh, I, I was very, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the irony to the business is you need to be available. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're working a full-time job during the day and you have to go to an audition at a casting agency downtown or whatever, um, you can't. Yeah. So it's this weird kind of world where you, you know, you can go days without an audition, but something can come up at the last minute and, oh, they want to book you downtown for a commercial. Mm -hmm. You got to be available. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. And uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's it's unpredictable. Right. Right. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit more about your coaching. Because um, mm -hmm. you do help people beyond the entertainment industry, of course. Yes. And yeah. uh, the way I look at it, connecting people to their inner passion, I mean, that's very similar to breaking into entertainment. I mean, oh. it can be challenging to give yourself permission to do what you want. Would you yes. agree? Well, challenging to do what you want, you nailed it. Because part of the work uh, with clients is being able to, you know, I use this, um, the, the reference of, uh, you know, when we're young, that the lens of opportunity is wide open. I think mm -hmm. I've shared you this, uh, this idea that when you're little, it's like you can do anything you want, right? Mm -hmm. And as we get older and, you know, we start businesses, we have families, whatever the obligations may be, uh, that lens gets 
smaller and smaller. So when you do hit that wall that I was talking about earlier, it's really hard for people to imagine doing anything outside of the scope of what they've been doing yeah. for 20, 25 years. Yeah. So part of the work is being able to create a safe space that people can open that up and say, well, I, I always, cause I ask, so can you remember in your life at any time when you were involved in something that you lost track of time with, mm-hmm. you know, and all of a sudden people are like, Oh wow. Well, I used to, I used to love, you know, doing pottery or I used to love writing. I used to love being part of a, you know, I used to work at a, a newspaper when I was younger and I love the energy there. And so that kind of is the launching pad for the coaching process. So then we start diving into those things, diving into those passions. And although you may not end up working again in, uh, you know, a newspaper, in the newspaper industry, we dig into what about that industry excited you so much. Mm-hmm. And then we open up the dialogue about, well, what else looks like that? What else is out there and available? And then we get to the point down the road. So what is it about your skills that are transferable into that? Or in some cases, some of my clients go back to school, mm-hmm. go back and take night classes, you mm-hmm. know, or if it's too foreboding, they go in a different direction. You know, I had one, one client who made a discovery that his real passion was doing, um, what's it called, the 23andMe. It's, uh, oh, the genetic testing. L- l- yeah, this is like l- uh, looking at people's yeah, past. And, and so he kind of, he identified that, but realized that he had to do some more, he had to get some more schooling in that, in that particular area. So that was kind of his long-term goal. And then we identified some goals for short-term. Okay, how am I going to make money in the interim in a job that I like doing as opposed to the one that I just left that I couldn't stand going to every day? Right. Now, so every client's uh, kind of map is different. And that's one of the you know, exciting things I find about it. Right. Well, one of the things that I think is neat about what you do is there's like some real – concrete things that are taken into consideration that that not all coaches do Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we get really involved it's like let's talk about passions and if you could be anything if i had a magic wand and i waved it over you what would you become yes but then they forget about the things like budgets and paying rent and absolutely making sure you can eat uh and setting expectations for how long it will take to land a job and really having the the concrete side of things right Mm -hmm. Right. So I always make it clear to people that reality will always be close by. Mm -hmm. No matter how wide we open that lens, because I do ask people, I do say if I can wave that magic, if you had all the money in the world, because that starts a dialogue that they may not be allowing themselves to have. Mm -hmm. So that idea, well, I always loved, you know, skiing or painting. So what is it about? And then, and then when you get closer to something, then it's like you start, you start bringing in. So, so this client I was just talking about, he, he got so, um, his, his job was keeping him basically from in, um, immersing himself in this process because he was, it was such a, such, such a horrible job. Mm-hmm. So rather than just saying, oh, why don't you just quit? Kind of like, hey, man, just jump off the cliff. Right. You know, right. But as a coach, I was able to say, so what would your life look like? And I'm not saying you do this, but what would your life look like if you did leave that job? And we talked about how long could you realistically survive? Mm -hmm. Do you have enough money to survive without worrying about getting another job for three, four, five months? Mm -hmm. How would you be spending your time? You know, so that's a really good point you bring up um, because I think the two work in tandem. You have to allow for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think along with those lines is how risk adverse are you? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause it's like if, as we were talking about with the voiceover work, if you're very risk adverse and you Mm -hmm. need to have the regular paycheck and you just, for your own soundness of mind, not just for uh, the physical paying of the bills, Mm -hmm. that's not going to be a career you're going to be happy with in the long term. That's right. That's right. 
Yeah. And that's one of the things you, we establish. You know, I have different um, exercises and uh, assessments that, that I work with. Um, and and I, with many of my clients, I create what I call their personal contract. So as we work together, we, we accumulate the, like your top five values, what your passions are, what your likes and dislikes. And we all combine them in this document. Mm-hmm. So that person moving forward you know, when we stop working, they can refer to that, you know, uh, so, so that they're not, so they can determine, okay, there's no way I'm going to be doing this, but I am open to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also important to be really kind of, you know, empowering yourself to ask for, for what you want, because so many people just are taking the next job because it's been offered to them. Right. They're not thinking, uh, is this going to impinge on my family life? Is this going to, oh, thank God, I got a job. I got to take it. Mm-hmm. You know, but often we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. We can pause. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the show that we're uh, getting up on now. Uh, so uh, where we get to talk about the tattoo of the day. And Harry, you actually have two tattoos, right? I so why don't indeed. you tell me a little bit more about those? Well, the one on my left shoulder is um, of a cartoon character called Winky Dink. So okay. <laughs> Winky Dink is a character my father created for oh. a television show, the first interactive television show uh, in the 1950s. I guess wow. you could say the very first interactive TV show. And it was a show called Winky Dink and You. Uh-huh. So um, you, you would order, a, order a, a Winky Dink kit that would come in the mail and it had a piece of plastic you'd put on the TV and you'd have magic crayons and, a, and you'd draw along with the Winky Dink show and they'd send Winky on an adventure and the bad guy would be chasing after him and you'd erase the bridge so the bad guy would fall in the water and it, it was pretty ahead of its time. So Wow, yeah, that's so pretty had, cool. Winky Dink on my left sho- shoulder to uh, kind of honor my dad. That's cool. Yeah. And then your other one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want to share this. The not other as one, proud of that one? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Um, uh, it, I call it my abomination, actually. I, oh. It's actually, to, I got this tattoo to cover, <laughs> to cover another tattoo. So it's a cover-up of a bad tattoo, and the cover-up is worse than the original was? Well, the bad wasn't so much – it wasn't a bad tattoo. It was my ex-wife's name. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's got to get covered up. Oops. <laughs> yeah, so, of course, I'm sure you're clearly familiar with tattoos. In order to do such a thing, you have to get a bigger and darker tattoo over the other one to do it. And Yep. So it's the, it's the – actually, it's the ohm sign. Uh huh. Um, you know, which is kind of cool, but it is, uh, it's kind of big and dark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have one like that too. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I do a symbolic tattoo. So I had a, a symbol for my first marriage, mm-hmm. um, which was like a griffin on my arm. And then okay. I got that covered up with a, gigantic bear paw for my second husband which is just entirely solidly black and it's kind of like a distorted bear paw because we just did like i was high when i got this done so of course that's interesting because it's just this great big blotch that's black yeah that looks a lot like the claws yeah and then then you got the claws going up but it's it's okay you know and i don't it would be impossible to cover up, but that's fine. Cause. Yes. Now, now my current uh, current girlfriend mm-hmm. uh, works at a spa and she does tattoo removal. And I asked her about it, and she said, "Well, you should come in for a test run because it's really painful, and it would probably take about three months to, to have this thing uh, removed." So, and it's uh, yours is pretty big too, isn't it? It's like yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, that's almost like your whole shoulder cap. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So it would I'd, it would be probably pretty agonizing. So yeah, I, I may still go in for a test run and see how painful it actually is. But right, or you could just get it covered up with something else. <laughs> yes, yeah, something even darker and blacker. Maybe yeah. a bear. Maybe a bear paw. Maybe a bear paw. There you go. 
<laughs> All right, uh, Harry, thank you very much for your time today. So how can people get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me by uh, going to my website, I think the best thing, which is harrypritchett.com. I'm going to spell that out, H-A-R-R-Y-P-R-I-C-H-E-T-T.com, harrypritchett.com. No T in the middle of Pritchett. No T in the middle of Pritchett. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, once again, everybody, my name is Donna Shannon. You can get a hold of us at Personal Touch Career Services. As my producer always reminds me to say, if you like what you hear, please give us a click. If you don't, keep it to yourself. And of course, you don't feel free to follow us on all the major socials. So thank you very much for your time, Harry. And until next time.